So we're picking up on one of the last segments in the Matter, uh, Matter PowerPoint uh, on this podcast, and we're going to focus on what are elements and what are compounds, the pure substances. As this graphic shows you, oxygen dominates as one of the elements in yet the Earth's crust, uh, in the Earth's crust, and yet it doesn't seem to make sense because 49% of the crust is what you think is an oxygen gas, but in reality, you know the Earth's crust to be solid. And the distinction then is that the oxygen is there all right, but it exists in the form of a compound. And that oxygen could be combined with many other types of um, elements to create all sorts of compounds. So for example, a common item that might be made up of these elements in their elemental form would be uh, aluminum perhaps for pots and pans or cast iron skillets and so on. But more commonly, the elements combine to create compounds, and that explains this prevalence of oxygen. For example, you can see that 25.7% of the Earth's crust is silicon, and yet it's not pure elemental silicon because it's combined with oxygen. And that compound, silicon dioxide, is uh, also called quartz, and it's a major component, say, of something like beach sand. So when you see the elements in the Earth's crust, as this pie chart shows us, they may not be in their elemental form. They more likely are in more stable um, compounds. So that leads us to our flow chart. We've been focusing on mixtures, impure substances, but now we're going to take a, a look at focusing in on pure substances, elements and compounds. Here are some pictures of the forms that elements can take on our brightly colored periodic table. In the bottom right, we've got a piece of elemental sulfur, one of the non-metals in the right corner. Here is a gas, that's one of the gases here, probably neon, being excited by electricity to give off light. Many of the elements, like three-fourths of them, are solid metals. But some of the metals that we have, especially the alkali metals, have to be stored under oil to prevent their reacting with water, which they can do so quite violently. So a wide variety of elements on the periodic table. Now an element is a pure substance that cannot be separated into simpler substances by physical or chemical methods. If I was to look inside that lump of sulfur, all I'm going to see are atoms of sulfur. Now I probably disagree with this slide. There's actually 92 naturally occurring. I can find uranium, which is element number 92. The others are synthetic or man-made elements, which we'll discuss later. And hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. At room temperature, 11 of them are gases. I would say two are liquids. Your textbook and others sometimes include gallium, but the gallium that I've seen has to melt at the temperature of, say, human body, which is higher than room temperature. So I would just say um, mercury metal and um, liquid bromine are the two liquids at room temperature. All the rest of the elements are solids. Down on the bottom right on a periodic table, lots of information is there. This doesn't show all that could be possibly shown. The name and symbol of an element, frequently its form of matter at room temperature. The number 17 stands for the fact every chlorine atom has exactly 17 protons or positively charged subatomic units in the nucleus. And down at the bottom, this thing called the atomic mass, it's really an average of the masses of all the different kinds of atoms of chlorine out there in nature. Those are referred to as isotopes, but we'll re return to them. Every atom of chlorine has 17 protons in its nucleus, but they might have different numbers of neutro neutrons and therefore might have different masses. But we'll learn how you can calculate that atomic mass and why it's not a whole number, why it's a decimal fraction later on. There are special kinds of elements that are called allotropes. It basically means the same element, but it's in a different molecular form, and yet it has to have the same molecular state, or physical state. So for example, here is oxygen on the right and ozone on the left. Oxygen is a diatomic molecule, that's what we breathe in. Ozone is a triatomic, but even though they're different colors, these are only made up of atoms of oxygen, and we, they're both in the gaseous state, so they're examples of allotropes. You might have smelled ozone if you've been in an area where there's like been an electrical short, or maybe if you're very sadly near a lightning strike. O3 for ozone, O2 for oxygen. Another very common allotrope you're probably using right now. 
If you're writing with a pencil, that's what graphite looks like from the Superman point of view. Carbon atoms arranged in hexagons, and yet the forces between these planes of carbon atoms are fairly weak, so the two layers can slide by each other, which is why when you push down with a pencil, you exert enough force to break those intermolecular forces of attraction and allow some of the atoms of your pencil to go onto the paper. By the way, it's called pencil lead, but there's no lead in pencils these days. It's just carbon. Diamond, on the other hand, is the hardest substance known, and the reason is is because even though it has the same basic hexagonal shape, it was formed under conditions of high temperature and pressure, whether naturally or synthetically, and therefore the forces between them are quite strong. They are both solids, although this is a dull black soft solid, and this one typically is a clear, incredibly hard substances. The only thing that each of these two things consist of are carbon atoms, henceforth that's why they're called allotropes. You can even get crazier allotropes of um, carbon. We call those bucky tubes or bucky balls. Carbon 16, 60 looks like that, kind of looks like a soccer ball. And it's named after a very far-thinking, far-sighted designer, architect, artist type of guy, Buckminster Fuller, who created, among other things, these homes that are called um, geodesic dome houses. There's still a few around in Marin. You could get these kits. Um, it doesn't have the bottom half of this soccer ball, Buckminster Fullerene, they're called, but the top of it kind of looks like exactly what you see here, a bunch of facets in what we call these dome houses. So they named these strange structures of carbon, these allotropes, Buckminster Fullerenes, and um, <clears throat> that they're still the element carbon, even though there's many, many atoms of carbon there. Now you can take two or more elements and combine them chemically. You'll see a chemical change take place. And when we see a chemical change take place, what we've done is combine two or more elements to create a totally new substance called a compound. It's still a pure substance because if I was to look into carbon dioxide, C with two oxygens, or water, H2O, all I'm going to see are molecules of water or molecules of carbon dioxide. And you can see they can have very different properties from their parents. For example, carbon is a sort of black, represented as a black atom, and yet carbon dioxide is a clear odorless gas. Methane is the gas CH4, C in the middle with four hydrogens, that we use in uh, natural gas. That's what comes out of our Bunsen burners. It's colorless and odorless. The reason why it smells from your Bunsen burners is an odorant has been added, so you can tell if you have a gas leak. NH3 with the nitrogen in the center is ammonia. And here are the three hydrogens. All four of these are molecules, which we'll distinguish later on. On the right-hand side, we're looking at what does it look like inside salt. That's a crystalline lattice of oppositely charged ions, positives attracted to negatives, attracted to positives, and so on. And so that's what we call an ionic solid. But again, sodium is a shiny metal that blows up in water. Chlorine is a poisonous green gas. And yet the combination of the two violently produces a stable white crystalline solid that can be eaten by humans up to a certain point. Uh, another molecular substance is a sugar. This is uh, C6, oh, C11, H22, O11. And sugar, of course, is white and granular, yet it's made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now, if the methods for separating a mixture are always physical methods, then the methods for separating compounds must be chemical methods. Electrolysis, passing electricity through water, will break the hydrogen and oxygen gas apart from each other, and you'll see those two gases come bubbling off when collected over water. If I want to separate the components of methane, I probably have to do a little bit more than combustion because when you burn methane, you make CO2 and water, but I could continue to break down the CO2 and the water to get down to the eventual carbon and hydrogen uh, molecule or atoms. Ammonia is a base, so reacting with it an acid might help the separation process. So we have a flow chart now of what we've learned so far about matter um, as the uh, chapter has progressed. Matter can be broken down into two major categories, 
mixtures and pure substances. Notice though that those two can only change back and forth from each other by a physical method. So for example, if I combine two pure substances like salt and water, two compounds, it'll just dissolve, which is a physical change, to make salty water. But that is a physical method, not a chemical method. If I want to go backwards and turn the mixture of salty water back into pure substances, I apply heat to drive off the water, leaving the salt behind. Now pure substances, as we just learned, are either categorized as elements or as compounds. And again, these two can only interconvert into each other through a chemical change. On the far left-hand side, if you recall in our first um, PowerPoints and podcasts, heterogeneous and homogeneous mixtures are distinguished by the fact that heterogeneous mixtures do not appear uniform throughout, whereas homogeneous mixtures do. That could kind of be a little confusing because it sort of depends upon your point of view. If I was looking at blood or milk on the macroscopic level, I'd see uniform red blood or uniform white milk. But if you go down at the microscopic level, I might see different proportions of different kinds of red and white blood cells in the blood. Or in the milk itself, it might have more or less um, amounts of butterfat, for example. A little agricultural trivia note, different breeds of cows have different amounts of butterfat that they produce. So for example, Holsteins, the black and white ones that we use typically in our commercial dairies, mostly, they have much lower butterfat than say the beautiful brown Jersey cows who have like five or six percent butterfat, very high. But our point would be that physical changes can only be intraconverting from pure substances to mixtures and it must be chemical changes that convert elements into compounds and vice versa. Now I think that's a good stopping point for this unit and we will pick up on the next and last vodcast when we discuss what are the mathematical concepts that go behind the matter unit. And that would be things like law of definite proportions and constant composition and multiple proportions. Okay, till next time, see you then.